Thank you, Brother Rick. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message and song this morning. And as we uh, think of the words Rick just sang, dear Heavenly Father, that we would allow you to be God in our life at all times, that we would have communion and we would have peace with you. We put our trust in you. Now open our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Let me ask you a question. What is one way to get to know someone really well? What's a good way to do that? A lot of us are going to do it after church today. We're going to go eat with someone, right? We're Baptists. We eat. All right. One of the best ways to get to know a new family at the church is we'll go out to eat with them sometimes and get to know them. What is a symbolic way to show peace with someone? Have a meal with them. The same thing. In the early days, a meal was an expression of peace, uh, the end of hostilities between two parties. In fact, if you look at, uh, you can turn to Genesis 31. You don't have to, I'm just summarizing this. We find Jacob. Jacob had uh, been mistreated. He'd been tricked over and over and over again for some 20 years by his father-in-law, Laban. And he decides to take his family and flee to, back to his homeland into Canaan. Well, Laban, he sets out after them and he catches up with them in Gilead. And at that point, they have a very heated discussion. But that night before, God had spoken to him in a dream. And it says that they made peace with each other. And verse 54 says, Then Jacob offered a sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat. It was that communion, that end of hostilities. Today, we will see that peace with God is also expressed in the, words of the word, uh, in the words of the Bible, through a meal with him. Now, what do I mean by that? We're going to see. Two weeks ago, we started looking at the Old Testament offerings God gave to the nation of Israel, the offerings that helped them to be a holy people. Remember what we said holy was. It was meant that they were set apart for him. They were set apart by God. And in these offerings, we also saw that each of them was and is a depiction of Jesus Christ. And we can see how through Jesus Christ, we today are set apart for him. We are set apart to be changed into the image of Christ, sanctified. Now, if you remember from last time, the offerings were presented from God to man. They did not start with man and then go to God. They started from God because all holiness begins with God and then goes out to the sinner. And last time we looked at two different offerings. We looked at offerings that deal with our commitment to God. The first one we looked at was the burnt offering. This was a voluntary offering. It symbolized a person's devotion to the Lord. And it was something, since it was given to the Lord, it was completely burned. All to the Lord, a perfect sacrifice, no blemish, nothing done half-hearted. The second offering that was given was the meal offering. And this was something where you were dedicating the things that God had blessed you with, that God had provided. And it showed that you were looking to God for your daily bread. He was the one that provided. He was the one when you had need and there was a reliance on Him. Both offerings were said to be a sweet savor to God. They were a blessing to Him. Voluntarily devoting ourselves to the Lord. And that's what we saw, these pictures of Christ, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ who gave himself freely, voluntarily for our sake. As Ephesians 5, 2 said, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So the first two offerings we saw were, showed the commitment to God. Today, we're going to look at the third offering. Turn to Leviticus chapter 3. And as you're looking there, this third offering stands alone. It's by itself. It is the peace offering. Where the two offerings before showed our commitment to God, this one here shows our 
communion with God, which was wonderful. The song Brother Rick sang, it goes right with our message this morning. Amazing how that happens so often, how the Holy Spirit orchestrates that in our life. And we find here the peace offering, the communion with God. We're going to be in chapter 3 and chapter 7. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is, is on them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver. With the kidneys it shall he take away. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now go over to chapter 7. This is now speaking directly to the priests about the same offering. And there's some things prior to this, but starting in verse 31, it says, And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons, and the right shoulder shall he give unto the priest for an heave offering of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron that offereth the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right shoulder for his part. For the wave breast and for the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offering and have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto the sons by a statute forever from among the children of Israel. Now you might be thinking that's a lot of detail uh, that doesn't apply to us much today. But there is a picture in this, just as there was in the burnt offering and with the meal offering that we looked at two weeks ago. Here we see the peace offering explained. Here's, we're given the details of this peace offering. Now, what are the details of this one? These are important. It had to be a male or female without blemish. As you read, we just read the first five verses, but it repeats itself three times. It could be an ox of the herd, Those were verses 1 through 5. Then it goes on and it says it could be a sheep or it could be a goat. doesn't really matter. It's just without blemish. The offerer, as very similar to the other offerings, would bring the the offering to the gate or the, the, the opening of the tabernacle, would put their hand on that animal, connecting themselves with that animal. All right? Identifying themselves with their animal. And they would kill the animal at that point. The priest then would take the blood of that animal and would sprinkle that on the altar. And then now there's something a little bit different with this one. He would take not the whole animal like we saw in the burnt offering. Instead, this one is a little different. And there's a reason why it's different. In fact, he would go in and he would take the fat that was on the innards, how we would say it in in Cincinnati, and... uh, He would take that, he would take the kidneys, these different pieces, and they would place those on the altar. Those would be the things that were burned. The priest, as we just read, the priest would receive two items. The priest would receive the right shoulder and would also receive the breast of that. And they call those the wave offering and the heave offering. Now, this is interesting. The the breast offering would be waved. All right, it would be taken and it would be done with like this. The heave offering, the, the right shoulder would be taken and they would do this with it. You could read into the symbolism of that if you want. But that would be then his to eat. He would take that and it would be his to eat. That's important. So there's something that's been put onto the altar. There's been something that's been given to the priest. And the rest of that, the rest of that animal was the person that offered it. It was theirs to have, and it was theirs to eat. They were supposed to eat it at that point. And since it was a full animal, they were to share it. They were to share it with their family. They were to share it with their friends. They were to share it with maybe those that were poor. He was to share it with others, and they had only two days, some of the offerings only one day, to eat that. Now, I think there's some reason before 
if they had only two days to eat and it's an entire ox, you would share that with other people. You wouldn't store it away and keep it for yourself. So it made, there was charity that was involved in this. This was an offering. Here's the key of this. This peace offering was an offering for peace and communion with God. It illustrated that I had peace and I have communion with my heavenly father. The main purpose wasn't for self-dedication like we saw in the burnt offering where I was dedicating my commitment to the Lord. It wasn't also for atonement, which we'll see in a couple weeks when we look at the, the sin offering and the trespass offering where I'm atoning for the sin that had been made, blood sacrifice for that atonement. This was for the, the, express, can, the express reason of gratitude thanksgiving to the Lord for mercies that God had provided in their life, for blessings that they had received, for just a thankfulness of who God is or for a vow that was fulfilled. And it was a sweet smelling savor to the Lord. This was an act of communion. Now, how do we see this? In this offering, we see three parties involved in this communion. God the sacrifice that was on the altar. We see the priest that had the heave and the wave offering. And then we also see the one that was offering the sacrifice. All sharing it together. All sharing it, symbolizing being at peace and holding communion together. Being there for each other. Having that connection If we read on in Leviticus 7, it also tells us that it was forbidden to be eaten if the person was unclean or if the offering was unclean. The set-apart person is to stay holy. The holy life, hear this, the holy life results in communion and peace with God. The offering kept gratitude in the heart of the believer. They were giving this out of gratitude and thankfulness, and it kept that in their heart. It kept a sense of devotion and holiness in their spirit as they made this offering. And it kept charity in their mind as it had to be eaten over those two days. Beautiful picture of this peace offering. Now, How is this peace offering expressed to us today? We saw that the offering, what it was and how it worked, but how is it expressed to us in New Testament days? Remember, all of these are a shadow or a depiction of Jesus Christ. And you may be here today and you have no peace in your life. You might be watching, you might listen to this later, and you have no peace in your life. I can tell you without a doubt that peace is unattainable without Jesus Christ. You will never have peace apart from Jesus Christ, both as our Savior and in our daily life as Christians, as He is our Lord. Due to the sin in every person's life, it causes us to be at enmity with God. We are separated from God because of that sin. There there is nothing we can do of ourselves to, to bridge that gap. We are separated from Him, and it is because of our sin that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to make peace for us. You say, how do you know that? Well, He tells us. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, he says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He made peace through the blood of His cross, so that you and I can be reconciled to our Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ made peace for us. The payment for our sin was made by Jesus Christ. And it was the only way it could be made. God was satisfied with that offering, and we, the sinners, were reconciled. 
He not only made peace for us, but Ephesians 2.14 tells us that he is our peace. For he is our peace, he tells us there. And then he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles coming together, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. It says here that Jesus broke down that middle wall. We are now one people. It's no longer Jew or Greek because he is our peace. Jesus is our peace. This speaks of communion. This speaks of fellowship, both with God and our fellow Christians. With our fellow man. We were all forgiven through Jesus Christ, and it results in the communion with God. So I ask you, do you have peace? You can only answer that yourself. The outward showings don't always tell us that. What starts with your need for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior and allowed Him to be that peace? But for us as Christians, it continues. It continues as you keep the same things as the Old Testament sacrifice. It, gratitude, holiness, Charity in our life. All of the things really add up into those three words. If you remember back in April, we uh, had a message on the significance of the Lord's Supper. Communion with our Lord. In the Lord's Supper, we see this same picture. We don't come to the Lord's Supper mourning the loss of our Savior. Rather, we come to the Lord's Supper to commune with fellow believers and with our living Savior, Jesus Christ, remembering what He did for us on the cross, but that He is alive today. And in that communion, we celebrate and we praise our Savior who He is and what He has done for us, reconciling us to our, Lord, to our Heavenly Father. In that, communi- in that communion, we also identify ourselves with our Lord and Savior and with each other. So we praise the Lord, we identify with the Lord, and also in that communion, what do we do? We examine ourselves. We take time and we examine our hearts, knowing to identify with the Lord, we must have a humble and a contrite spirit. We must be repentant of sin in our life. That our heart is clean as we go before the Lord, as the Holy Spirit searches our heart and brings those sins to our attention, that our right relationship is there. Not our standing, our relationship with the Lord. Our whole peace with God is only through Jesus Christ. It's the only way we can have peace. Jesus is the peace offering. Do you know Him? Do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't, I encourage you to call out to Him today for salvation. We will have a time of invitation and we will have altar workers that would love to share with you. After a service, I'd love to speak with you as well and show you how you can come to know Christ as your Savior. But for Christians, do you have communion with God? Do you have it? Are you set apart to where you can have that communion with the Lord? We see in this Old Testament how the peace offering is explained, how it's expressed through Jesus Christ. And I want us to see this last point is how it's exampled. How is it exampled? In the New Testament, the word peace is offered, uh, is expressed in five different ways. Three of them deal with what we're talking about today. Peace, meaning a right relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Peace, having a right relationship with other people, and then peace, that inner serenity, tranquility, the virtue of knowing, living a life that causes peace in our daily life. This peace is always, every one of them, associated with God. There is no way to have peace without God. That is both now and that's both in the Old Testament. We see the peace offering many times offered by individuals in the Old Testament, but I want us to see four instances here where it was done as a nation. 
Uh, if you can turn to these if you'd like, I'm just going to sort of run through these. But the first one we find in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 17. In chapter 6, uh, this is where David has finally brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. It is a day of festivities. This is the day that, that David was dancing. He was so pleased. He was dancing before the Lord as he brought the tabernacle, I'm sorry, as he brought the Ark of the Covenant up into Jerusalem because it represented the presence of God with his people in the capital city of the promised land. It was a fulfillment of scripture that this was going, that this happened. And at that time, he had a dedication service and peace offerings were given and every man was given flesh and, and something to drink. And they, and they had this day where there was a peace offering for the nation. The second time happened with his son. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 63, you can go through chapter 6, 7, and 8 and see all the dedication of the temple. David had brought the tabernacle up, but now Solomon had built this entire temple, one of the wonders of the world. Every detail of it was just perfect. And he brings this in there, and King Solomon has a peace offering of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. The entire nation from the river before Egypt over to the, to, the coast, to the coast, to the north, all of that was covered. And people for 14 days were coming in and they were eating of these peace offerings. They were having communion and celebrating God's communion with His people in the temple that God had allowed them to have. Beautiful picture of what God was doing in their life. Then in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and 30, there's been over a half a century of idolatry that's gone on in the nation with Manasseh. And finally we have his grandson, Hezekiah, this godly king. He turns the entire ship, he turns the entire nation back to God. The, the temple had been in shambles, centuries had gone by now. The temple was in shambles. He has the temple restored. He renews the sacrifices. And for seven days, they have peace offerings. And they, have, they celebrate the thanksgiving and the communion that was restored with God. This entire thing, each of these instances resulted in communion, a relationship, peace with God, with God, with their fellow man. And they were holy people that were set apart for him. Now, Turn with me to Exodus 32. Exodus chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So the people have left Egypt. They've only been a few months. God has taken them to Mount Sinai with a high hand. Miracles beyond miracles they have seen. Now he is giving the law to Moses up on top of Mount Sinai, but the people can't wait. And it says there in verse 5, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, meaning this false god they had made. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Okay. And they rose up early on the morning and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. They had made a false god. They had made the, the, the golden calf. They were celebrating, worshiping this golden calf. And verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have, what? Corrupted themselves. They had corrupted themselves. Here is an example of a peace offering made with the world. Not to God. This is a peace offering made to the world. Idolatry. While Moses is off with God on the top of Mount Sinai, the people's hearts wandered, and it says they made peace offerings. It meant that they were at, by saying that, it meant that they were at peace with the idol. 
They were identifying themselves with the idol. And their communion then was not with God, but with with wickedness around them. And what is the result? Verse 7 says that God said they corrupted themselves. They were drinking. It tells us they were dancing promiscuously. There were other sinful activities when they rose up to play. What a difference there is here. When we have communion, when we have what we feel is peace with the world, it leads us further into sin. Broken relationships come with this kind of communion with the world. Harmful actions to our body come from this. A lack of self-control happens this. And there is no peace. That name peace offering in this account means nothing. There is no peace Because the people were worse than when they started. They were farther down that path of sin than when they began. And when we decide to have communion with the world, that is exactly what we are doing. We are drawing ourselves farther away from the Lord. We are causing no peace in our life. We are allowing sin to flourish in our life. Now look at communion with God. It leads to a restored relationship with God. It leads to fellowship with both God and our fellow man. And we actually have true peace in our life, both inside and out. I would rather have that. We commune with God in many ways. How do we do that? It starts with our salvation. We have to have Jesus Christ. Peace begins only with Him. But it continues to grow. Slowly, but surely it is growing. As Christians, as this communion, this peace with God, it grows through our daily walk with the Lord. It involves our time in the Word of God as we, as we read the Word of God, as we're feasting on the Word of God, as we're praying and we're thinking about what we have just read, meditating on the Word of God, as we speak with God, in our time of prayer, and as we go through the day and as we speak to the Lord through, through our day and in those times which we've set aside so that we can speak with Him. It continues as we take our decisions, as, as Brother Rick sang, as we take our decisions, all of them, before the Lord, as we have problems, as we bring them to the Lord and we, we talk with Him and we allow Him to work in our life. When we take our victories, just as these peace offerings of the great things that happen in their life, when we take these victories to the Lord, to Him in thanksgiving and in gratitude. And it continues as we come together to serve the Lord, as we will do this week in Vacation Bible School, as we've done through this week, as we've passed out flowers as we shared Christ with people through this week, as we passed out tracts and things of those natures. And when we come together today to hear the teaching and then the preaching of the Word of God, when we speak about God and in our, in our growth groups and as we talk together and as we come together in fellowship just to be with other believers, to be friends and to live our lives together, all of these things are peace offerings and communion with God as our life begins to grow. All of this draws us to gratitude toward God. It grows us in holiness in our life and in charity toward others. I ask you again, do you have peace in your life? Well, let me ask you the next question. With whom are you eating? The world or the Lord? That will determine if you have peace in your life. Are you communing with the Lord? Not just something we do on Sunday. Not just something we do on a Wednesday. Is your life communing with the Lord? Or is it with this world? True peace only comes with the Lord. What a beautiful picture this peace offering is. Friend, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. And you can have true peace in your life. Christians, how are we living? Who are we dining with? The Lord? Or everything else around in this world? Let us decide. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for 
this offering that is pictured here. We thank you that you would even have a desire to be with your children, that you would provide a way of salvation through Jesus Christ, and then that we wouldn't be just servants, dear Heavenly Father, but that we are actually your children, that you decide and you choose to live with and to guide our lives. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to seek you in our life. If there are any that don't know Christ, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just burden their hearts and draw them to you now. Dear Heavenly Father, if there are any that uh, have, uh, don't have a church home, that you would be with them as well and just encourage them to come and be part of us today. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen.